Thank you very much for your kind remarks, Frank. I'm not used to people saying such nice things about me these days. It's, uh, subject, of course, is uh, China's rise, whether China can rise peacefully. Uh, before I get to the heart and soul of my argument, I want to make two preliminary sets of comments. Uh, the first is that there are really two big questions on the table. Uh, the first question is whether or not China will continue to rise over the next 30 years, much the way it's risen over the past 30 years. And then the second question is, assuming that it does continue to rise, can China rise peacefully? With regard to the first question, I'm just simply assuming that China is going to continue to rise. I'm actually surprised at how many smart people here in the United States and in China think that China's rise is going to slow down uh, and that the problem of whether or not China can rise peacefully is never going to really uh, manifest itself because China's just not going to rise the way people like uh, me are assuming. Uh, but anyway, again, you just want to understand, I'm assuming that China is going to continue to rise, and then the question that I am going to answer is whether it can rise peacefully. My second preliminary point is that this is ultimately a theoretical question. You can only answer the question with a theory. And the reason is that we have hardly any facts about the future. The future hasn't happened yet. So you have to answer this question with a theory. Because again, we don't have any facts. I often run into people who say that, you know, I've been to Beijing and I've talked to this person and that person, and after talking to this person and that person, I'm firmly convinced that China can rise peacefully. I always say, this is ridiculous. Who cares what person X or person Y has to say today? Those people will be dead in 20 or 30 years. Right? And the people who will be running China then are probably in third grade or fifth grade now. Uh, and you don't know what they're going to be thinking. Furthermore, you also want to understand that we're not talking about China today. We're talking about a much more powerful China. We're hypothesizing a situation 10, 20, 30 years down the road where China is much more powerful than it is today. And as you all know, when the structure changes, the behavior of the agents often changes. As I say to students, if I give you, a poor student, who has $100 to his or her name for the rest of the semester, $5 million, and I tell you, you can do anything you want with that $5 million, you're going to behave very differently over the rest of the semester with that $5 million in your back pocket than you are with $100 in your back pocket. And when you have 15 carrier battle groups, you know, hundreds of attack submarines, many armored division equivalents, lots of SS-18s, whatever, right? You behave very differently when you have a much smaller military force. Structure matters, right? So we're talking about a situation down the road. And again, to deal with that situation, we need a theory. This brings me to my talk. Three parts. First, I'm going to lay out my basic theory of international politics my theory of great power politics, how I think the world works, part one. Part two is I'm going to give you a synoptic version of American foreign policy since 1783. And what I'm going to try and do in giving you this synoptic version of American foreign policy is convince you that it fits with my theory, all for the purposes of giving you confidence in the theory and also for helping to answer the question how the United States will react once China begins to rise. So the second part of the talk deals with American foreign policy over time. And the third part of the talk is to deal with the question of how China will act if it becomes much more powerful, and how the United States and China's neighbors will react to China's behavior. And of course, the argument that I want to make is that Chinese behavior will imitate American behavior. That's my bottom line here. The Chinese will behave like the Americans, and both the Chinese and the Americans will act in accordance with my basic theory of great power politics. So that's the story that I'm going to tell. Let me start off with my basic theory of international politics, then go to the American case, and then go to the Chinese case. 
My theory, as some of you know, starts with five simple assumptions about the world. And then I take those five simple assumptions, I put them into the blender, I hit the on switch, and I get what is a very competitive world. A very competitive world in which the principal goal of states is to become a hegemon. Now I'm going to tell you how those assumptions lead to that outcome. The first of the five assumptions is that states are the principal actors in the international system and that there's no higher authority that sits above states. States are basically like pool balls on a table. Some are bigger than others for sure, but otherwise they're just like pool balls. Or as we sometimes say in IR speak, they're like black boxes. And there is no higher authority that sits above them. That's why we say that the international system is anarchic. Anarchic here does not mean murder and mayhem. Anarchic is just the opposite of hierarchic. It's an ordering principle. The system is anarchic. States are the principal actors. That's the first assumption. The second assumption is that all of those states have some offensive military capability. Now there's no question that how much offensive capability each of those states has varies across the cases. Belgium and Switzerland and Jordan and Guatemala obviously have very little offensive military capability. Countries like the United States, countries like China, countries like Israel, just to name three, have significant offensive military capability. But regardless, each state has some offensive capability. The third assumption, which is of enormous importance, has to do with intentions. As many of you know, if you do threat intelligence, or threat analysis, you're in the intelligence business and you're trying to assess a threat, you pay attention to the capabilities of your adversary as well as the intentions of your adversary. Now my second assumption dealt with capabilities. There I said all states have some offensive capabilities. My assumption that deals with intentions says that states can never be certain about the intentions of other states. And the reason that you can't be certain about the intentions of other states is because intentions are in people's heads and they're very difficult to see and measure. During the Cold War, when we looked at the Soviet Union, right, and we tried to assess its capabilities, it was reasonably easy to do because they had these material capabilities that were visible to us in most cases. And we could figure out, for example, how many SS-18s they had, how many boomers they had, how many armored division equivalents they had. We had a very good sense of exactly what Soviet capabilities looked like. With regard to Soviet intentions, it was remarkably difficult to figure out what the Soviets' intentions were. Who knew for sure what was in the head of Nikita Khrushchev or Joe Stalin or Andropov or Brezhnev? It's just very difficult to tell. So intentions are, are they're just difficult to discern. Now, even if you disagree with me and you think that it is possible to now figure out what intentions are, it is very difficult, I would argue impossible, to figure out what future intentions are. Nobody can tell me what the future intentions of Germany will be or China will be in the year 2020. We just don't know. So there is uncertainty about intentions. Let me give you an example from the non-military realm that illustrates this point. Talk about divorce. Anytime two people get married, they, in almost all cases, love each other and think that the other person has benign intentions towards them. Otherwise, they wouldn't get married, right? Nevertheless, we have a divorce rate in the United States that hovers around 50%. That means that one out of every two times, people are guessing wrong about the intentions of their partner, right? If you really think about it, and this is very depressing, you can never be certain 
that the person that you're marrying won't turn into Attila the Hun somewhere down the road. Now, I want to be very clear here. I am not saying that you can be certain that the person will turn into Attila the Hun. It's not my point. My point is you can't be certain that that won't happen. And the same thing applies in the international system. If you're talking about Germany, right, it's 1919, right, what is Germany going to look like 20 years henceforth? You can't be certain that Germany will be a status quo power or whether it'll be a revisionist power. It's just impossible to know. So I've laid out three assumptions to start. One is that the system is anarchic. States are the key actors and the system is anarchic, which simply means there's no higher authority. Two, all states have some offensive capability. Three, with regard to intentions, you cannot be certain about the intentions of other states, and that's certainly true with regard to future intentions. Fourth and fifth assumption, very straightforward. Fourth assumption is that the principal goal of states is to survive. Survival is the highest goal that states can have. And the reason is, obviously, if you don't survive, you can't pursue those other goals. So survival is number one. The final assumption, the fifth assumption, is that states are basically rational actors. They're strategic calculators. They're actually quite good at coming up with strategies that maximize their prospects of survival. So those are the five assumptions. As I said in the beginning of my talk, you take those five assumptions, you put them in the blender, and you hit the on switch. And you get three forms of behavior. First of all, states fear each other. That level of fear varies across space and time, but states fear each other. The reason they fear each other is twofold. They fear each other in part because they worry that they will end up arrayed against a state that has a lot of offensive capability and has malign intentions, that is a revisionist state. The second reason that states fear each other is because of what I call the 911 problem. If you end up living next door to Germany, really powerful Germany, and it has malign intentions, and you dial 911, there's nobody at the other end because it's an anarchic system. There's no higher authority that you can turn to in international politics. Right? Second form of behavior you get is that you quickly understand that it is a self-help system. To use my mother's terminology, God helps those who help themselves. It's a self-help system. Right? There's no 911. You can never be sure about the intentions of other states, and therefore you go to enormous lengths to create a situation where you can take care of yourself. When the money's on the table, you want to be able to protect yourself. Third form of behavior is that you quickly understand that the best way to survive in this system is to be the biggest and baddest dude on the block. The more powerful you are, the less likely it is anyone will attack you. How many of you Americans go to bed at night worrying about Mexico or Canada or Guatemala attacking the United States? It's unthinkable. You all sleep well at night. And the reason that you sleep well at night is that the United States is the equivalent of Godzilla in the Western Hemisphere. No country in its right mind in this hemisphere would pick a fight with us. Well, if you're in an anarchic system where you can't be certain about the intentions of other states, and you're interested in survival, there is no substitute for really being big and being powerful. Right? To put it in slightly different terms, the name of the game in the system is to be a hegemon. Because if you're a hegemon, your survival is almost guaranteed. And of course, my argument is that every, every state in the system understands this logic, and that's what produces security competition. What I've said to you so far is the principal goal is to be the hegemon in the system. My argument, however, has to be qualified. I do not believe it is possible to be a global hegemon. The planet is simply too big and there's too much water on it. And therefore, I think the best any one country can do is it can be a regional hegemon. And as I'll talk about in a few minutes, the United States is a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. Right. You want to be a regional hegemon. That's your first goal. 
And your second goal, to put it in Pentagonese, is to make sure that you do not have a peer competitor. In other words, you want to make sure that there is no other country on the planet that dominates its area of the world the way you dominate your area of the world. Now you're probably saying to yourself, why is John saying this? Why should a country like the United States that dominates the Western Hemisphere worry about a peer competitor? This is the reason. Most of you have probably never wondered why it is that the United States is roaming all over God's little green acre, sticking its nose in everybody's business. Well, one of the principal reasons is that we have no security threats in the Western Hemisphere, and we are therefore free to roam into other areas of the world. What the United States does not want is a situation where there is another great power that so thoroughly dominates its region of the world that it is free to roam into the Western Hemisphere. And I'm going to talk about the Monroe Doctrine in due course. But the United States wants a Germany that has to worry about Russia and France and Britain. It doesn't want a Germany that dominates Europe and is free to roam in the Western Hemisphere. You think the Chinese are happy? I'll talk more about this in due course, about the fact that we have military forces located all around them. Right? We are free to roam. We don't have to keep forces here in the Western Hemisphere because there are no threats. So the basic argument that I'm making is starting with these five assumptions, you end up in a very competitive world where if you're interested in maximizing your prospects of survival, you have two goals. One is to be a regional hegemon, and two, make sure there is no other regional hegemon on the planet or no peer competitor to put it in pedagogies. That's my basic theory of international politics. Now let me go to the second part of my talk, talk about the United States of America. I want to go from 1783 to the present, give you a synoptic version of American foreign policy, and basically make the argument that my theory fits very neatly with how we've behaved over time, right? which has little to do with the picture that most of you have in your mind about American foreign policy over time. When the United States got started, it was 13 measly colonies strung out along the Atlantic seaboard. We marched across North America to the Pacific Ocean, we murdered huge numbers of Native Americans. We stole their land. We went to war with Mexico and stole what is now the southwest of the United States. We invaded Canada in 1812. We were deeply interested throughout the 19th century in making Canada part of the United States. The reason that Toronto is not the capital of Canada and Ottawa is the capital of Canada is that the British and the Canadians expected us to pay a return visit and they did not want their capital overrun in the initial stages of the war. So they picked a city that was further away from the border with the United States. We were deeply interested in conquering more territory south of our border, especially in the Caribbean. The principal reason we didn't do it was because of the slavery issue. The northern states did not want more slaveholding states in the Union. As you know, the sugar industry dominated the Caribbean. The sugar industry is labor intensive. There were lots of slaves there. And the North said no more states that had slaves. Otherwise, the Caribbean would be part of the United States today. The United States had a voracious appetite for conquering territory. And in fact, in modern times, there is no single state that has a better record at conquest in the United States. Adolf Hitler before, or I should say, right after he launched Operation Barbarossa on June 22nd, 1941, into the Soviet Union, often talked about the United States as his model for how to create Lebensraum. He believed that the United States knew how to create Lebensraum. The United States is a highly aggressive country, right, with it record unparalleled in conquering territory. Uh, we, of course, call this manifest destiny, but it was only one part of the story for purposes of achieving hegemony in the Western Hemisphere. The other part of the story was the Monroe Doctrine. As you know, 
When we got started as a country, there were all these European great powers that were operating in the Western Hemisphere. In 1823, old President James Monroe basically told the Europeans, this is our hemisphere, we intend to throw you out. We're too weak to do it now, but we will eventually throw you out, and after we throw you out, you're not welcome back here. That's what the Monroe Doctrine is all about. Some of you in the audience are old enough to remember when the Soviets used to put forces in Cuba during the Cold War. It drove us stark raving crazy. Who are these Soviets to come into the Western Hemisphere? This is our hemisphere. They are not supposed to enter here. By 1898, in the wake of the Spanish-American War, the United States had finally established regional hegemony. We had created this very powerful state that dominated North and South America, and we had pushed the European great powers out of the hemisphere. Again, the first goal of states is to establish regional hegemony. Second point is, the United States, we should expect not to tolerate peer competitors. We had four peer competitors in the 20th century, Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the former Soviet Union. The United States played a key role in putting all four of those countries on the scrap heap of history. We intervened in World War I in April 1917 when it looked like Germany might tip the balance and win the war, and we helped finish off the Germans. We entered World War II, single-handedly defeated the Japanese, and helped the Soviets and the British, mainly the Soviets, defeat Nazi Germany. And of course, during the Cold War, for roughly 45 years, we played the key role in containing the Soviet Union, and then when it was time to usher it down the toilet bowl, we did that with great ease. Fact is, the United States had no interest in allowing any of those countries to dominate Eurasia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere. And a number of presidents and their lieutenants have made it clear since the Cold War ended that we have no intention of allowing any country to dominate Eurasia. It's completely consistent with my theory. So what I'm saying here is if you look at American foreign policy over time and you think about how we have really acted instead of the stories that we tell ourselves, right, what you see is that the United States has behaved in large part according to my theory. This brings me to the third part of my talk. China. As I said to you before, the Chinese are going to imitate the United States. They're going to try and dominate Asia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere, and they're going to try and push us out. Now, let's talk a little bit about dominating Asia. Don't you think that the Chinese are going to try and create a situation where they are by far the most powerful state in Asia? They'd be fools not to. Do you know what happened to them between 1850 and 1950 when they were weak? The European great powers and the Americans, and especially the Japanese, did terrible things to them. Chinese fully understand this. If the Chinese have two choices. One choice is they can be 25 times more powerful than Japan, or Japan can be twice as powerful as the Chinese. Which one do you think the Chinese are going to take? Or you think the Chinese are going to say, oh, it doesn't matter? You think the Chinese don't think it matters whether they're more powerful than Japan, or more powerful than Russia, or more powerful than India? It's, it's OK for us to think that way, right, but not them. No, no, the Chinese understand full well. In this world, you want to be really powerful. And if you're not really powerful, you run the risk that people may do terrible things to you. And that includes the United States of America with its open door policy. Chinese have no illusions about what that was all about. Right. So the Chinese, and I believe they're very smart to think this way, are going to want to create a situation where they are by far the most powerful state in Asia. What about the Monroe Doctrine? You think they're going to have their own Monroe Doctrine? You think it's okay for us to have a Monroe Doctrine and for us to go ballistic when the Soviets come into Cuba, but it's perfectly fine, or it should be perfectly fine, when we're running aircraft and ships up and down their coast. You don't think they should care about the fact that we're sitting there 
with a huge number of real military assets right off their coast. They're not going to like this, right? They're not going to like this. And you can already begin to see talk surfacing about pushing the Americans out beyond the first island chain. So they're going to be very interested in having their own Monroe Doctrine. That's coming. By the way, the Japanese had their own Monroe Doctrine in the 1930s. Chinese will have their own Monroe Doctrine. As my mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. The Monroe Doctrine's good for us, it's good for them. Right. So they're going to want to dominate Asia the way we dominate the Western Hemisphere. Now what are the Americans going to do? I told you what the theory says, and the historical record is perfectly clear on this. We do not tolerate peer competitors. I occasionally go to China, and the Chinese will say, why can't we have equality? Why can't we be equal powers and run the world together? I said, this is not the way the United States of America operates. Equality? We don't believe in equality. We believe in dominance. We're very interested in being by far the most powerful state on the system. Of course, we don't talk that way. We've got all this liberal rhetoric that's designed to bamboozle not only the American people, but people across the planet. The Chinese thought very hard to bamboozle. They figured out how the United States operates a long time ago, right? But they want equality. We do not believe in equality. There's only one regional hegemon allowed in the system, us. No peer competitors. So we will go to great lengths to stop them, just as we did with the Soviet Union. Right. We, we will not allow them if we can prevent it. Not clear if they really continue to grow that we'll be able to prevent it over the long term, because they may be so big and so powerful there's nothing we can do about it. But that remains to be seen. And in the meantime, we will go to great lengths to contain them. What about China's neighbors? China's neighbors, you can already see evidence of this, right? China's neighbors are very worried about where this one is headed. And I'll tell you what the balancing coalition is going to look like. It's going to be South Korea, Japan, the United States, of course, Vietnam, Singapore, Indonesia, India, Russia. That'll be the balancing coalition, right? And you can Google any two of those countries. Go home and Google India and Japan. And what you'll discover is that the Indians and the Japanese are beginning to form close relations. And the Indians and the Japanese are both very worried about the Chinese. Right? And remember, we're talking about a situation where China gets much more powerful. Right? And in that world, those alliance relations will tighten even more is that we're going to have a pivot to Asia. We're obviously going to move some military forces into the Asia-Pacific region. President Obama and his lieutenants are going to claim, as are most Americans, that this is being done for defensive purposes. If you're sitting in Beijing and the Americans start swinging military forces into the Asia-Pacific region, this does not look defensive in nature. It looks offensive in nature. And of course, the Chinese will respond by spending more and more money on defense and building bigger and bigger forces. You can already see the Chinese doing that. How will the Americans interpret that? I can guarantee you that the Pentagon will describe this as offensive in nature. This will be evidence that the Chinese have malign intentions, we'll be told. Right? They are developing bigger and more powerful offensive forces. Again, this is the basic security dilemma. Anything that China does to defend itself looks offensive to us and vice versa. And of course, what this does is it fuels an intense security competition. So my bottom line here is that if China continues to grow economically, uh, in the decades ahead, much the way it has over the past 30 years, uh, that China will translate that economic might into military might, and that it will try to dominate Asia and to push the Americans as far away as possible. I think this is a very smart strategy from China's point of view, because I think the best way for any country to survive 
in an anarchic world, a world with no higher authority, with no 911, where you can never be certain about the intentions of other states, is to be a regional hegemon. And by the way, that's why I think the founding fathers and their successors went to enormous lengths to create a situation where the United States turned itself into a Goliath in the Western Hemisphere. I don't think they did it because they were malevolent. I think they did it because it is the best way to, survival, to survive. But the problem that we face here is that the Americans and China's neighbors will resist China's efforts to dominate Asia. And that will create potential conflict situations. And I would not even be surprised if you ended up with a few wars involving China and the United States. So I am very pessimistic about the future. Let me conclude with a comment about theory. As I said to you in the very beginning, to answer the question whether China can rise peacefully, you need a theory. And I, of course, laid out my theory. But like all social science theories, my theory is a rather crude instrument. I believe that the best social science theories get it right about 75% of the time. And let's make the generous assumption that my theory is one of the better ones in social science and therefore gets it right 75% of the time. Let's just assume that. If that's true, it still means that I'm wrong 25% of the time. Given the pessimistic story that I've just told you, let's hope that the rise of China turns out to be one of those 25%. Thank you. I will gladly take questions. Uh, I would ask that people who ask questions limit their questions or your statements. You can make statements uh, of any sort uh, to one minute and try and ask one clear question if possible. Uh, and uh, so we can get as many people in as possible. And if you just stand up, that would be very helpful. So I'll get the gentleman in the rear. Well, there are a number of points here. First of all, if China were to rise uh, in the way I'm assuming, uh, one could argue that you would be in a bipolar world, uh, much like the Cold War. In the Cold War, it was the United States and the Soviet Union. It is possible. It's hard to tell exactly what the architecture will look like, but you could be in a bipolar world that involved China and the Soviet Union as the two poles in the system. That remains to be seen. Uh, China will not be part of the balancing coalition. Uh, the balancing coalition will be the United States and China's neighbors, most of China's neighbors, arrayed against China. Now, I think your most important point was about territorial conquest. There's no question that in the age of nationalism, conquering territory is difficult. But one can hypothesize a number of scenarios that involve territorial conquest that would lead to war. And surely the best issue, the best example here is Taiwan. As you know, the Chinese are deeply committed to making Taiwan part of mainland China. And one can hypothesize plausible but unlikely scenarios where a war breaks out and China ends up conquering Taiwan. As you also, I'm sure, know, there has been a big dispute between the Chinese and the Japanese over a handful of rocks uh, 
in the East China Sea, sometimes known as the Senkaku or Diao Islands. One could imagine the Chinese going to war against Japan and trying to conquer those islands. The final scenario I would point to is Korea. Uh, one can imagine a situation where North Korea and South Korea get into a war and the South Koreans end up crossing the 38th parallel and because we're joined at the hip with the South Koreans, we in effect end up crossing the 38th parallel too uh, in a situation that's not altogether different from what you saw uh, in uh, 1950. Uh, there's also the fact that India and China have a border dispute there's disputed territory before them. They fought a war in the early 1960s over this. And you could imagine a war being fought again over that disputed territory. I don't think there's any chance that China is going to invade India and try and conquer it or vice versa. But you could have a conflict over territory. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, I would say that with regard to Admiral Inman's question, that when I've, I've given this talk in China, I would guess 50 times, exactly as I gave it here, uh, and I've given it even more times in the United States. And the principal argument that is raised against me is what I call the economic interdependence argument uh, that Admiral Inman just laid out. And the argument here is that China and the United States, and China and its neighbors are hooked on capitalism. We have all this economic interdependence. Everybody's getting rich. And who in their right mind would kill the goose that lays the golden eggs? That's it in its crudest form. Now, I think there is some truth in that. I, I think that uh, there are uh, uh, potential situations where economic considerations would dampen down the tensions. I, I don't want to deny that. But I think that one does not want to overestimate, or under, excuse me, one does not want to underestimate the extent to which politics trumps economics in certain cases. First of all, we had a lot of economic interdependence before World War I, and we still had World War I. Secondly, if you look at the Japanese and the Chinese going back and forth over the Senkaku Islands or the Diao Islands, right, uh, both of those countries have a deep-seated interest at this point in time from an economic perspective not to let things spin out of control. But as you well know, the nationalism in China and even the nationalism in Japan, which is really politics, is powerful enough that we could hypothesize situations where the politics trumps the economics. To take just one more example, Taiwan. The Chinese have said that if Taiwan were to declare its independence, they would go to war over Taiwan despite the fact that they understand that that would do enormous economic damage to them, okay? The Chinese are saying that with regard to Taiwan, you have a situation where politics trumps economics, right? The other thing is, sometimes if economic good times turn into economic bad times, all of that interdependence can actually fuel conflict. So we have to be aware that that's a possibility as well. So my bottom line on this is that 
I think that there is some truth in what you say, that given the economic interdependencies of today and the likely future, it will sometimes be a break or it'll sometimes ameliorate the pressure to go to war. But I'm one of those people who believes that politics usually trumps economics. And My basic argument is that it's for political stability inside China. That, most, that if they can't continue to go pro class, then the Yeah, but my... Okay, my, my view of what's happening inside China is that I think that the regime has significant legitimacy problems. And I think it is based largely on the fact that communism does not have the sort of legitimacy that it once did. And the card that the Chinese elites are playing to compensate for the fact that communism doesn't have much legitimacy is nationalism. And nationalism, right, it's a bottom-up phenomenon in China as well as a top-down phenomenon. And you can hypothesize all sorts of situations where nationalism just pushes the Chinese to behave in very reckless ways. So there may be an element of truth in what you say, but I think there's a contrasting story that cuts in the other direction. I, I just get this gentleman over here. Yes. Can you stand up, please? Just. The whole, uh, let, let's just leave, in, in the interest of time, let's leave Germany and Japan aside, just focus on the China side of the story, right? I, I think there's no question that over the past 30 years, in keeping with your comments, the Chinese have benefited enormously from playing in an American dominated system according to our rules. So the argument I would make to the Chinese, building on this gentleman's comments, is look, America has been very good to you. An American dominated system has led to all of this tremendous economic growth. So why don't you just accept your status as a second rate power and continue to get richer and richer and richer? Right? Why upset the apple cart? The Chinese are very worried about their sea lanes of communication because sea lines of communication, they get lots of oil and gas that comes across water. And some of them are talking about building a blue water navy so they can protect their slocks. My response to them is, you don't have to protect your slocks. We will protect them for you. We are the imperial power. We basically run the world. We know what's good for everybody. And look at how you've benefited over the past 30 years. Just continue to play this game. That's your basic argument. They are not, in my opinion, you may be right. They, they may be willing to continue to allow us to dominate the system. But I don't think so, right? I think they will not accept second-class status, and I think if you look at how they behave in international institutions now, they do not like being relegated to the second row. 
They want to be up there with the Americans. They want to write the rules like we write the rules. And furthermore, they believe, I think, that they have lived in a rather precarious world. They worry greatly about the United States. This is very hard for most Americans to understand, but most countries outside the United States, not true in Europe, but outside of Europe, most countries worry greatly about America. They think America is very powerful. They think America is a bully. And they don't want to be in a situation where the Americans can push them around. If the Chinese have had no choice but to live in a world where America controlled the sea lanes, they understand that. But now they may have a choice. And if they have a choice, they'd rather control their own sea lanes than have the Americans. So my argument is that they will reject your logic and they will operate according to my logic. Now, I may be wrong. I don't want to say you're wrong and I'm right. As I said to you before, I have a theory about how the world works and I think I'll be proved right. I hope I'm not. And I understand the power of your logic. It's not not a foolish logic, it's actually a quite intriguing logic, but I don't think the Chinese are gonna buy it because I don't think that's how great powers behave. I think when great powers get really strong, right, the appetite grows. Sir. Okay, uh, with regard to the one-child policy, I think that China's population is rapidly aging, and uh, I think that a number of people who I have talked to in China and in the United States believe that one of the reasons that China's economy will slow down over time is because of this aging problem. Now, there are very smart people on the other side of this debate as well, and I don't know who's right or who's wrong. I personally hope that the Chinese economy slows down. You understand where I'm coming from, right? I do not want to see China continue to grow over the next 30 years the way it's grown over the past 30 years. I'd like to see the Chinese economy flatline. The idea that I would be enthusiastic about the growth of a powerful China whose intentions I can't know is not in the cards, okay? So I hope that the aging problem is a real drag on their society. Not because I dislike the Chinese. I, I actually love going to China. I'm intellectually more at home in China than I am in the United States. I find the Chinese much easier to talk to about strategy, and military affairs than I do most Americans inside the Beltway. Uh, culturally, I'm a complete fish out of water, but intellectually, I'm much more at home in China. I really like going to China, so I'm not anti-Chinese. It's just that as an American, I do not want a situation where we have an equal, getting back to my response to this gentleman on my right, okay? Uh, so I hope uh, the one-child policy is a drag. With regard to the surplus of males, this is a very interesting question. Lots of people believe that this will make China more aggressive, right? Uh, and there is a literature on this. I I'm not sure what to think, okay? Uh, but there are a number of co countries. South Korea, by the way, is another country. India is a country. And China is a country that all have uh, 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 significant surpluses of males. Uh, sir, right, right behind. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that uh, the most powerful argument against me is not economic interdependence or this argument. I think the most powerful argument against me is the nuclear weapons argument. And the argument goes like this. John, we live in a nuclear world. Virtually all of the main actors in this game have nuclear weapons. And in a nuclear world, you're just not going to have 
the kind of security competition and, and the kind of potential for war that you describe. It's just not going to happen. Uh, my response to that is there is a certain element of truth in that. That's why I said I think it's the most powerful argument against me. Uh, but we did have the Cold War, right? And we had an intense security competition between the United States and the Soviet Union, even though we had nuclear weapons. The second point is, if you look at the geography of the Cold War and you compare it to the geography of a U.S.-China competition, the potential for war, I think, is greater. Uh, I think in, in a U.S.-China competition, uh, because of the geography, uh, I think nuclear weapons will have less deterrent effect in a U.S.-China competition. Let me explain that. During the Cold War, the competition centered on Europe. And it centered on a war along the intra-German border between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. And it basically meant you were going to end up fighting World War III with nuclear weapons. And that was such a horrific thought that we had great difficulty getting wars started in Europe when we played war games, because everybody was so remarkably cautious. If you look at the geography in Asia, and you look at the potential flashpoints, what you discover is there's no equivalent of the Central Front. And in fact, we're talking about possible wars in the South China Sea, over Taiwan, over the Senkaku slash Daiu Islands, over Korea, right? And it is possible to imagine shooting wars involving the United States and the Chinese in those conflict scenarios in ways that was not the case in the Cold War with the United States and the Soviet Union because of the fact that the Central Front was like a giant magnet on the board, right? So I think that there's a real possibility that you could have wars in Asia even though we live in a nuclear world. However, the final point I would make is that I think that given the presence of nuclear weapons, it's almost impossible that you would have a World War III-like situation involving the United States and China. I think you could have minor conflicts of the sort that I was just describing, but that's about it. So I think nuclear weapons are a powerful force in the other direction. Yes. So with this plan, with, uh, with this new uh, I guess, uh, event, how do you see this um, fitting in with the overall picture between um, Japan and China and um, in the rare earth elements picture? And how do you see that fitting in with your, uh, your overall theory that economics is just a smaller part of the overall international relations picture? Yeah, well, I think that as you described it, there's no question that <clears throat> the whole issue of rare earth metals uh, caused certain trouble uh, between China and Japan. And if you're correct, I, I didn't know anything about these recent discoveries, but if you're correct, and I have no reason to doubt you, uh, that will probably go a long way towards ameliorating this problem. But I think this problem is a very, very small slice of the problems that we're going to face between, the United, between China and Japan. So I think in the overall scheme of things, it just doesn't matter very much.
China and Russia actually starting to get a bit closer with the SCO and all that? Um, What's the SCO? Uh, the oh, Shanghai Cooperation. Oh, okay. Well, just very quickly, uh, when I was talking about encirclement of the Soviet Union, that was during the Cold War. The United States. When you were talking about uh, China, the, the U.S., Russia, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, as a sort of counterbalance to a rising China, um, with many of those same countries being involved in the SCO, with the exception of the United States, how would that exactly? The balancing coalition will trump the SCO, right? This is my whole argument about politics trumping economics. Just let me come at this from a slightly different perspective. If you go to Australia today, or you go to South Korea today, what you discover is that many people in those two countries are deeply concerned about the views that I express. And that is because they understand that from an economic point of view, Australia and South Korea have done enormously well engaging in extensive economic intercourse with China. This is the golden goose. Who, here comes John with this story about you know, security competition. He's going to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs, OK? And they don't want to hear that a choice has to be made. But my argument is that you can have a lot of economic interdependence, right? But side by side with that economic interdependence is going to be security competition. This is what you had in Europe before World War I. You should go back and just read about Germany's relations with its neighbors. As is the case today, was the case then. Germany traded extensively with all its neighbors. So there was a lot of economic intercourse. But there was also this intense security competition that finally blew up in the July crisis of 1914. Right? And so what you're going to have in Asia right, is you're going to have a lot of institutions and a lot of countries that are committed to fostering economic interdependence. And the question is, how powerful is that economic interdependence going to be when arrayed against the security competition that I think is inevitable? And that is the big question. And as you know, my view is that politics will uh, trump uh, uh, economics. And, and that's why this balancing coalition will trump Shanghai. Why should we believe that China would behave that way? 
But what, what was your first point about the United States being different? Uh, you, so your point is it's hard. The structure of the rise of the United States. I'm going to grant everything you say about the kind of power the United States becomes. And I think there's a lot to what you're saying. I particularly agree with your point that many people fear the United States. We don't recognize that. So I, I'm on with you on that. But the rise of the United States, right, as you define it, is largely a function of the absence of structural factors that are there in the Chinese case to prohibit. The Chinese okay, rise. okay, okay. Strong, just okay. To get them on the table, strong neighbors and resource surpluses. Right. Uh, I would note that in the case of Imperial Germany, Napoleonic France, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union, those five potential regional hegemons all faced powerful neighbors and all had resource constraints, yet nevertheless, all five of them tried to dominate their region of the world. And they failed in every case. So there are five examples. And I think that China is going to behave like Napoleonic France, Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the former Soviet Union, right? And I don't think there are any cases in the international system where you had an especially powerful state uh, that didn't try to make a run for the money. But, but then, if I might, John, then I think that that gentleman's argument and the admiral's arguments are persuasive to the Chinese. Because look what happened to those states. You posited the United States as the historical model because the United States would be a successful outcome in the eyes of the Chinese. I would therefore say to the Chinese, if you believe the United States is the one successful of all the examples you've given us of a regional hegemon that succeeds, that doesn't destroy itself, right? Well, the United States is able to do that because the conditions are so fundamentally different, not because the American people are better, but the conditions are so fundamentally different from the ones you have, China. I would say to the Chinese, do you want to be Nazi Germany or do you want to be the United States? Do you want to be Nazi Germany or do you want to be Napoleonic France? You better play by our game, no, no, not that, No, that, that's exactly the question. Do you want to be Nazi Germany or do you want to be the United States? Right? Or let's say Imperial Germany because it's a less uh, hot label, okay? <laughs> Uh, you want to be Imperial Germany or you want to be the United States. They want to be the United States. That's my point. Your point is that it's very difficult to imitate the United States because it was relatively easy for the United States to do it. He's absolutely correct in that regard. Their view will be that there is a danger here that we will get decapitated and will end up like Imperial Germany or any of the others. But what we have to do is do it very smartly. This is why the Chinese pay very careful attention to this whole question of whether they can rise peacefully. I do not believe the Chinese can do it for the reasons that Jeremy said. Right? He, he's absolutely correct. First of all, they've got Godzilla, also known as the United States, sitting on their doorstep. And apropos the question about nuclear weapons, we have nuclear weapons. There are a lot of other countries out there that are pretty powerful, and for them to achieve regional hegemony is going to be very difficult, right? And <laughs> they fully understand that, right? But my point is they're going to try, right? And they're going to think they can do it smartly. And my point is that there is potential for conflict. Yeah. 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 This is a great question. Uh, and, and I'll give you my speculations on it. Uh, if you're looking for a good paper for a thesis, good topic for a paper, for, for a thesis, this is a great topic. Uh, assuming that, uh, that uh, I'm essentially correct about uh, a forthcoming security competition between the United States and, and China, what 
does Europe do in, in this story? Let me just step back a second uh, and talk about American grand strategy. Uh, since the beginning of this country, uh, the most important area of the world for the United States has been Europe. Realists like me like to argue that there are three areas of the world worth fighting and dying for, Europe, Northeast Asia, and the Persian Gulf, okay? And throughout my lifetime, whenever I taught grand strategy courses, we always made Europe the number one interest of the United States. It's because it's where the great powers were, the wealthiest great powers. We are now undergoing a fundamental transformation where Northeast Asia or East Asia is becoming the most important area of the world to the United States. The Gulf is going to be number second, and Europe is going to be a distant third. Right? This is really a revolutionary development. Now, if I'm right, and the United States cares greatly about Asia, and as I'm sure most of you know, Asia is inextricably bound up. China and India are inextricably bound up with the Persian Gulf because they get lots of oil and they're going to get increasing amounts of oil and gas that comes out of the Gulf. So the Persian Gulf and Asia are the two areas I believe we're going to concentrate on in the future. And I believe that Europe is going to be shortchanged for good strategic reasons. This then raises the question that this gentleman asks, which is how do the Europeans react? There are a few Europeans who are desperate to keep NATO alive who say that the Europeans will come to Asia and be part of the balancing coalition. I think these people are smoking some bad stuff, right, to be honest. I, I, the Europeans, <laughs> with this Rube Goldberg device they created called the Euro, right, are in the process of bankrupting themselves and they're not going to be able to spend any money on defense and they're not going to be able to go to Asia to help us. And furthermore, even if they had the money and the resources, they're not going to, they're not going to be part of the balancing coalition in Asia. So the question is, if you're a European, how do you think about this? And I think a very good case can be made, I'm not sure of this, that the Europeans will try to stay neutral and they'll try to trade with both sides and make lots of money. And it'll make us very angry, but there won't be much we can do about it. But all of this gets back to my first point, which is if you think about it, we are really seeing a, uh, a fundamental shift in American strategic priorities. And the whole focus that we've had on Europe since the beginning is beginning to change. And I think, apropos my latter comments, this will free the Europeans up if the scenario I'm talking about proves to be true. It'll free the Europeans up to play both sides. One more, okay. Hi. Could you stand up, please? I'm a first year GPS student, and my question is, if China's rising and all these countries are gonna balance against it, it would be very expensive for the U.S. to get involved in any of these conflicts, and we have these great oceans between us and China. Why should we do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the isolationist argument, right? Uh, I should just tell you, uh, uh, I believe the case for ice, I'm not an isolationist, I'll be very clear, I'm not an isolationist, but the case for isolationism is very strong, right? It is no accident, ladies and gentlemen, isolationism was so powerful in this country in the 1920s and 1930s, and that Franklin D. Roosevelt had such enormous difficulty defeating the isolationists, right? The argument that people made in the 30s is that we're separated from the rest of the world by two giant moats. How can anybody get at us? And now we've got thousands of nuclear warheads to boot, right? Why, why do we care? Why do we care whether China dominates Asia? To sort of play off of your argument, why don't we just continue to trade with China? We both get rich, right? Even if they want to write the rules out there and control the sea lanes, what do we care? What do we care if they're number one? We'll just get rich. Nobody can get, a, get at us. John says that survival is the principal goal of states. We've got it made in the shade with regard to survival, right? So the question is, what is the argument against isolationism, right? And it's my freedom to roam argument. 
it's really the, I think, the only argument against it, right? And remember, there's no way we're going to have Normandy II <laughs> across the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean, you know, with the Germans landing on Long Island or the Chinese or the Japanese landing in San Francisco. That's not going to happen. That's his point about the oceans. It's what I call the stopping power of water, right? The great problem that we worry about is that a country that has regional hegemony in another area of the world, like China or Imperial Germany, can form an alliance in the Western Hemisphere with a country that is an adversary of the United States. In other words, what you really worry about is Mexico and the United States have a falling out and bitter relations develop and China forms an alliance with Mexico and China puts military forces in Mexico or in Brazil. Let's say Brazil begins to grow more and more powerful. It's actually getting very powerful and the Brazilians and the Chinese become very friendly and the Chinese begin to station forces in the Western Hemisphere. So you don't need Normandy too in this story, right? China, Imperial Germany, they're free to roam and they roam into the hemisphere, right? That is the only argument I think you can make against the isolationist position that you point out. Because otherwise we are a remarkably secure great power. In a way it gets back to Jeremy's point, right? Remember what Jeremy's point to me was, John, it was very easy for the United States to establish hegemony in the Western Hemisphere because, as he said, you know, we didn't have powerful neighbors, right? We were separated from the European great powers by the Atlantic Ocean and so forth and so on. We were not dependent on all those resources and on and on. You take his argument and you marry it to his argument. That's the case for isolationism. Again, I'm not an isolationist, but if you really think about it, it is a very difficult uh, it's a very difficult argument uh, to defeat. Again, this is the problem Roosevelt faced. American people really did not want to go to war against either Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan. He worked overtime to get us into that war, right, because of the power of that logic. John, we build you as smart, <laughs>